But in any case, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, insights we have from, uh, have gotten from um, the analysis of the uh, C. elegans uh, genome. And I should just say at the outset that I, I've really enjoyed um, being part of the um, Encode project for the past number of years. I mean, I think it's been a very nice community to uh, work in and um, really kind of uh, inspiring uh, scientifically. And I'm hoping we get our first slide. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll just, uh, oops, that's in front of me. Oh, here we are, yeah, great. So, so I wanted to sort of start off by just um, putting the um, analysis that we talked about in the Seal Against Genome in the broader context of the uh, ENCODE project. And Elise um, has done a really great job in the previous talk of introducing all these projects. Uh, I think an important thing to realize, you know, as Elise pointed out, was that the Mod ENCODE projects in some sense were um, pilot projects for the uh, annotation of the uh, human genome. And uh, this, this year, we hope to see um, the annotation of the human. So what I'm going to focus on is talking about the annotation we did of the uh, worm uh, genome and the lessons we learned from that and how we applied them a little bit in the uh, annotation of the human. So you can see how uh, the research kind of translates. And in further talks later on, we should hear about um, uh, future analysis that people are thinking of doing where they're really trying to uh, compare the worm fly and human in a kind of apples to um, apples comparison. So I just thought I'd start off by giving you my own view on um, high level view on genome annotation or how you do it. Uh, as I see it, there's kind of two main tracks. Uh, one I call kind of comparative um, analysis and the other is functional. The comparative analysis is basically you take the genome of interest, the worm genome, you compare it to lots of other things. You find things that are um, conserved, that don't change much, either a lot or a little. Uh, and you, th those regions of conservation in, the, in and of themselves become annotations. And of course, you can do this uh, in quite a large scale with the human genome. You can look at it uh, verse, of it, verse itself within the human population and so forth. Uh, and the second type of annotation is you might say functional annotation. And this, of course, is um, when you look at the readout of a functional experiment, such as RNA-seq or CHIP-seq over the genome. And there you'll get a noisy signal over the whole genome that gives you some readout of what the genome is doing, if it's being transcribed or something's binding to it. And what we do uh, often is we process the signal and smooth it, and then we, from looking at the signal, we get little regions that we call initial annotations. We might group them together into larger and more meaningful units. And that's kind of my um, high level on what we do in this process. Now, much of uh, the... Um, the worm genome and particularly the human genome are not, not genes. They're uh, large intergenic regions, and people often call them the dark matter of the genome. And I thought I would just say a little bit of why I think they're really important to think about. And um, I actually really like the um, analogy with the actual dark matter in the sky. So this is a, a picture that shows the stars, and it shows how the dark matter in the universe acts as kind of a lens to, for, to the starlight. And in a, sort of, in a sort of similar way, I think the uh, non-coding bits of the genome, they act as a kind of a lens that um, sort of modulates the effect of the genes. They, it, this is where all the regulation and control of the genome is. Um, an, another thing that we found with an encoder is a lot of the non-coding regions of the genome are uh, transcribed and in some sense functional. They also form a very nice historical molecular record of the genome. They have a lot of molecular fossils. And of course, within the human context, many of the disease associations we find are in the uh, non-coding regions of the genome. So I'm going to focus on the analysis we did on the worm genome. I thought I'd first just introduce very briefly the data, and I'm going to introduce extremely briefly the human data that I'm going to maybe uh, connect a little bit with this. And so in the, um, in the, the worm data uh, consists principally of this time course through the uh, development of the organism. And we have lots of data on this time course. We have RNA-seq data, small RNA data, and long RNA data. Uh, we also have um, tiling arrays on um, various tissues. And then we have ship seek of a, a number of factors, about 22 factors for the um, integrative analysis that we publish. And we also have um, polymerase in most of these uh, stages. And we have um, uh, chromatin marks in uh, embryo and larva. Now, just to give you a sense, because I'm going to be talking about how we apply some of the approaches to the human. In human, um, they don't have the wonderful time courses, but they have lots and lots of cell lines. They focus most of the data on three of them. They call tier one, 
uh, cell lines, and they have many more uh, transcription factors, about 120 in total, lots of deep RNA-seq, just um, tons of it, and, um, uh, you know, about maybe 12 main histomarks. So this is a tremendous oversimplification, but just to get people on the same page. So what I'm going to touch on today is I'm going to talk about these five topics, the analysis of the expression time course, analysis of non occurring RNAs, looking at the activity over the whole chromosome, uh, talking about regulatory networks, and then talk about how we can kind of relate these things together, um, the histomark, the transcription factors, and the gene expression with statistical models. And I put this little word "um" next to uh, four of these uh, five points because for four of them we really can talk about very, very directly how analysis approaches that we built in mod ENCODE really were directly applicable to, um, to human ENCODE. So first of all, the uh, expression time course analysis. Um, here uh, we have all the different stages. And let's just start out by looking at the kind of traditional uh, clustering that you get when you do this. If you cluster the gene expression uh, over the time course, you very nicely see the embryo and the larval separate. Now this isn't probably not unexpected, but it's of course satisfying to see this type of thing. And then we looked at the um, tissue uh, samples that we had uh, for both um, embryo and larval. We could kind of, and we looked at the kind of a principal coordinates uh, projection of them. We could kind of see kind of all the embryo uh, tissues being in one place and the larval tissues uh, being in another place, kind of moving into two uh, different regions of gene expression space. Now, one of the nice things, really nice things about the um, mod encode data set was that all the experiments were coupled. So we also have a coupled uh, polymerase binding experiment where we can look at the, the binding of the polymerase in the same stages, same, um, same situations. And you can see here, if you cluster that, you get the nice separation between um, embryo and larval. And we can also directly correlate the binding with expression. And here we found something that was not completely obvious. We found this interesting situation. If we looked at expression early, it tended to actually be correlated with binding late. And we, we puzzled about this for a while, and we never, never got a completely satisfactory explanation. I mean, some ideas we had it had to do with the stalling of the um, polymerase, but a, a somewhat unexplained observation. Um, now, since these were RNA-seq um, experiments, we could, of course, look at um, splicing in detail. And we figured there's about uh, 280 genes that changed uh, greatly uh, over the time course from the total uh, worm genes. And here's an example of one of the genes that uh, changed greatly in its uh, splicing structure over the um, time course. OK, so now we talk about uh, non-coding RNAs. So uh, one of the really nice things about the uh, RNA-seq experiment, of course, is we could identify lots of regions of the genome that were active beyond uh, genes. And we identified uh, about 7,000 candidate regions, um, small regions that we thought could potentially be uh, transcribed non-coding RNAs. And um, we, uh, these were uh, validated, and to some degree, uh, we believe they have a very good um, uh, sort of um, positive rate or predictive positive value. Um, now, one of the lessons we got from this is that no single individual experiment was really successful in pulling out the non-coding RNAs, and you really got a lot of value from kind of evidence integration. And you can see this pretty clearly here. So this is a, a total RNA tiling array from this. And here is an example of the, the known non occurring RNAs that we knew were non occurring RNAs. And here are uh, protein coding genes. And here's intergenic regions. So you can see this with this one experiment. You could not draw a threshold in any one place that would really cleanly separate the blue guys from these um, green and yellow things. And if you start looking at you know, more things, you, you know, sort of plot two different uh, features of non occurring RNAs relative to each other, you can see you get a, you can start to get a better separation. And as you get more and more features, you're able to discriminate better. And so I think this was a, a kind of a principal approach that was, that was really borne out here. Uh, and you can, you can see this actually specifically if you look at a particular gene. I'm particularly interested in pseudogenes. We can look at a non occurring RNA that intersects a pseudogene and creates a transcribed pseudogene. And so here's the transcription of the, um, the parent gene, and here's the transcription of the pseudogene. Now, there's an, in, these are in different um, stages. And of course, when you're looking at a pseudogene, you're always wondering, oh, am I looking at mismapping reads or some form of cross-hybridization and so forth? But you can see when you look at these many different experiments, this uh, pseudogene has a very different transcriptional life than its parent, right? It, it's not in any way correlated with its parent, and that gives us a lot of 
confidence that it has an independent transcriptional life. Um, overall, in the worm genome, we found about 1,200 pseudogenes with about 16% of them having fairly strong evidence of transcription. So uh, we carried uh, essentially this approach in these lessons to when we did the human an analysis, and you can, we drew very similar pictures here, and here's a particular example of the same type of thing for uh, transcribed human pseudogene. And so overall, the human project found many, many more um, uh, sort of non-coding RNAs was about, in, within the GenCode project, there was about 5,000 some odd link RNAs, about um, 12,000 uh, pseudogenes that were annotated to high quality, and about um, 900 of them uh, had very good um, annotation of being transcribed. Okay. So next thing uh, that we found in our analysis is we looked at the overall distribution of um, activity over the uh, chromosome. And the first thing I'll show you is a kind of plot, it's kind of like an accounting plot of um, the different regions in the genome and how much they were covered by uh, different bits of activity. So if you take the entire uh, worm genome, you find that about a third of the genome is under constraint, okay? And then if you take that bit and you say, if, can you account for all of those constrained bases in terms of some form of activity? And some, of course, of it is in genes, um, but lots of the other regions are counted for by TF binding or by particular punctate um, chromatin marks and so forth. And only about 20% um, or a fifth is unaccounted for. And so we found that overall we could account for most of the constrained bases um, in the worm genome in terms of some form of um, genomic activity. Now some of the patterns we found were kind of interesting. So when we looked at the um, histone marks on, on the chromosomes, here's a picture of a, a chromosome. This is chromosome three. And here are all the variety of histone marks. You probably can't read these very well, but there's, these are all the different marks here. And one of the things we found, which was very striking, was that we had an elevation of repressive marks. This is like H3K9 um, at the arms of the chromosome and a kind of depletion of activating uh, marks. And this was on all the autosomes. And if you look in detail at the junctions here, and they're sort of zoomed in, you can see there are fairly uh, sharp uh, junctions between these kind of, for these repressive um, arms. And the, uh, the sex chromosome was very different. It has, you can see just right away, a completely different marking uh, than, the, uh, than the autosomes. So very um, interesting uh, large-scale patterns. Another thing that we found when we started looking at the chromosome distribution of the binding was that when we looked at the transcription factors, we found that um, often they were just bound all over the genome and, you know, sort of higgledy-piggledy, but there were a number of regions of um, kind of, co I want to say coordinated, but um, clustered binding in a particular spot, and we called these hot regions. And here's an example of what I mean. Um, here's a number of different transcription factors, and you can see these are various places of the genome. Where one's binding here, one's binding here, but in this particular spot here, all of these guys are really um, zapping down on that particular uh, spot. And um, overall, we, we uh, found about 300 um, hot regions in the genome, and then we looked at the properties of the genes that were nearby to these hot regions, and they had very distinct properties. Um, they tended much more likely to be essential uh, genes. And also, um, they tended much more likely to be um, ex expressed in all the different tissues um, of, the, of the worm. And uh, this type of approach for looking at um, hot regions was um, applied in human. Of course, in human, we identified many, many more hot regions because of the much larger uh, extent of the genomic space and also the larger number of transcription factors that we looked at. There was tens of thousands of hot regions um, identified in the human genome. But, same, but essentially, this is really an example of the same approach that was scaled up uh, pretty directly. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little more detail about the transcription factor analysis and the work on the regulatory network. So, when we took the binding of all the transcription factors um, in the worm genome, we found that uh, we could arrange these into a, a regulatory network. And one of the nice things about the worm genome is it's fairly compact, so it's, pre it's fairly direct going from the binding site to the target gene. It does not huge um, intergenic spaces. And we looked at the regulatory network. It, had about it has about 25,000 edges. This is just the larval um, network that we're looking at. 
And there was these 25,000 edges um, involve about probably 6,500 target genes. These are non-transcription factors. And then here's the transcription factors. And of course, they have their own little network where one TF regulates another. And we, and we found from looking at the um, connectivity in the network, we could put some of the TFs on the top. These are things that mostly just regulate. Some of them on the bottom that tend to mostly be regulated by other TFs and some in the middle. And then in a very rough way, we could find differences between these levels. And so for instance, I've colored the essential TFs red, the Hox ones yellow, and you can see the Hox ones tend to be more on the top. Uh, we also looked at the tissue specificity of these TFs, and you tended to get the more specific ones at top. But obviously, we don't have very many TFs here, and the statistics are a little weak. But as I'll uh, point out in a second, when we scaled this up to the human, I think it was really satisfying to see the same approach work, but scale up with much uh, better statistics. Um, another thing that we found when we looked at this hierarchy was that we could merge the microRNA regulation with the TF regulation, and that it nicely fit into this kind of hierarchical view. So here I show the microRNAs that regulate TFs, the microRNAs that are regulated by TFs, and you can see you get more microRNA regulation at the top, the regulating the TFs at the top of the hierarchy, uh, and, and so forth. Now another thing we could do is in addition to kind of looking at the global overall hierarchy of the TFs, we could look at kind of little subclusters of TFs, uh, kind of you might call network motifs. Uh, and here's, for instance, a network motif of two TFs, and this uh, triangle represents a microRNA, and how they kind of all work together. Now one thing you can do is you can enumerate all these little motifs and count how many times you see them in the overall bigger network, and some of them are going to be um, more common than you might expect, um, and others less common. So here's the complete enumeration. You can't probably read this here, but here's how many times this little thing occurs. And then here's a picture of the seven overrepresented motifs. And let me just uh, focus on this one overrepresented motif here. This is a feed forward loop, and that means you have, we have a microRNA that regulates the transcription factor, it actually represses it. This TF uh, activates another TF. And that mic, uh, microRNA also represses that first TF. And you can actually, this is a very overrepresented motif, and you can actually think about what it might be doing. Well, if this microRNA wants to turn off this transcription factor, it sort of turns it off, but it also turns off at the same time the thing that activates it. And so it kind of makes, makes sense. Now, as I said, we, we scaled this approach up to human, and I, I think it was really satisfying to see um, the exact same approach, literally the same. Um, machinery uh, scaled up to human and just getting much better statistics because of the larger number of transcription factors. So here's the human uh, transcription factor network. Now it's, we're looking at 120 factors. And we found that we could arrange this very nicely into a hierarchy. Uh, this hierarchy is built so that the downward pointing edges are shown as green and the upward pointing edges are shown as red. And so you can see you can arrange it very nicely into a hierarchy where most of the edges are pointing um, downwards. Okay. And so you very much have a sense of some TF sitting at the top and some are mostly being regulated. And then, just as with the worm, we can take this hierarchy and we can paint it with various genomic properties and look at the differences. And so, you know, I, I like to compare um, this TF hierarchy sometimes to a social hierarchy, because people have a lot of you know, in, um, intuition for that. And so we might say, well, what are the differences of the TFs on the top? And are they more influential? And so how can we measure um, influence of a transcription factor? Well, we can measure it in terms of how it affects the level of gene expression. So if we take a given transcription factor and look at how correlated its binding is with the expression of its target gene over all of its targets, um, a more influential transcription factor will have a greater correlation. And then what I can do is I can color all of these transcription factors by their influence, and that's what you see here. And then what I can do is I can average that number over each of the levels. And you see overall that the top levels tend to be somewhat more influential um, overall than the bottom uh, level. Uh, another thing we can do is we can, of course, look at the uh, connectivity with the microRNA network. Um, now, it's a little hard, since there's so many TFs and so many microRNAs, it's kind of hard to make that picture as I did for the worms. We found it better to kind of arrange things in a circle. So here's all the microRNAs, all the TFs, and, you, and here's all the connectivity between them. And you can see the highly connected TFs tend to be uh, connected to the highly connected microRNAs, and there's a very strong positive uh, correlation there. We can also look at uh, how this relates to the hierarchy. And, and just as we saw for the worm, 
you get more microRNA regulation at the top uh, than at the bottom. There's also a, another column, too, because you also have the degree of regulation of the transcription factors onto the microRNA, and again, a little bit more uh, at the top. So the top of the hierarchy is better connected and a little more influential. Um, the other thing we can do is, of course, look at the motif analysis, just like we looked at for the worm uh, genome. Here I'm just going to look at all triplets of TFs. And um, we found, just as we found for the worm, this tremendous prevalence of feed-forward loops. And so I'm just going to show you a feed-forward loop now that involves three TFs, one that regulates the second. It also regulates the third, and the third regulates the second. This is the most overrepresented motif in the network. And also, other overrepresented motifs have are essentially feed-forward loops with one variation, a kind of toggle switch variation on them. And you can get some understanding of what these feed-forward loops are doing if you actually paint them onto the hierarchy. You can see that most of the feed-forward loops tend to involve um, kind of regulation through the middle level. And so you can see very much how the middle level is kind of mediating uh, the regulation through these uh, feed, little feed-forward loop constructions. Okay, so that's the analysis of the uh, regulatory network. And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, statistical models uh, trying, to, trying to put these things together. So I'm going to talk about, there's, you know, as Elise pointed out, one of the main things that we looked at in the uh, Mod Encode um, project was the process of transcription. And there's many different elements that are part of that. There's obviously the readout, the gene expression, there's the binding of the polymerase, but there's also binding of transcription factors, the modifications of the histones and so forth, and how do all these things fit together? Now, the, the arrows really go back and forth. It, you know, you can't necessarily say that, for instance, the chromatin structure causes this. You know, sometimes the active expressing in itself changes the chromatin structure, but we can look for statistical correlations between all these um, things. And I'm going to show you two main types of statistical correlations, uh, or actually three main types, one looking at the histone marks related to gene expression, one looking at the TFs related to gene expression, and then just looking at the histone marks relative to the TFs. So first of all, um, the, the simple thing you can do is you can take all the histone marks and you can just look at them, uh, aggregate them upstream of the TSS of genes and so forth and look, look at how they look for the highly expressed genes and lowly expressed genes and so forth. Let me just zoom in on one mark here. This is H3K4. And here's the, what the mark looks like for highly expressed genes. For lowly expressed genes, you can see there's an obvious difference. It's elevated for highly expressed genes. This probably suggests that we can get some predictive uh, value from this. And so what we did is we built a simple model where we took the TSS and we, went, we looked at lots of little bins uh, upstream of it and downstream of it. And we looked in each of the bins, we looked at the level of the different, uh, different marks, okay? And we tried to uh, see the degree to which those levels and how would be predictive of the uh, gene expression level. And so let me just show you the degree to which each of those predictors is successful. So here are all the different histone marks. Here are all the different bins. And what I show you in each bin is the correlation of that bin with the level of gene expression. And so you can see some of the marks are uh, very correlated, some are anti-correlated, these are repressive marks, and some of the correlations are very dependent on the positioning, okay? So the nice thing is you can put all this together uh, into a, a predictive model, and when you do a predictive model, you often uh, build one of these uh, rock curves, and here's a, a rock curve classifying highly expressed versus lowly expressed genes. You can build one of these curves for each of the different bins, and you can see which bin is more predictive. And that tells you where the histone marks are, in a sense, more important for governing gene expression. And lo and behold, the most predictive position turns out to be right at the TSS. Then the next thing you can do is you can say, well, how well can I predict the overall level of the gene expression uh, in a statistical sense? And so here's uh, what you get. And actually, I think, lo and behold, and this was very surprising to us, you actually get a good prediction. This is a pretty good R, um, R value of 0.75, uh, where you can put all the histone uh, marks together and get a good sense of expression. But what I think is even neater is you can take this model that we built on protein coding genes, OK, parameterized on protein coding genes, without touching any of the parameters or anything. We can go upstream of the microRNAs, and we can try to predict their level of gene expression, and then we can match that against the uh, match data sets we had for the small RNA expression. And we don't get as good of an R, but I still think we get a fairly satisfying result where we can actually find that that model actually encapsulates something about the, the, the thing that goes into transcription. So now we scaled this up to mammalian systems, a lot more data points, uh, as you might see. So this is what we have in the ENCO production project. Look at that R value, 0.9. That's an extremely good R value. 
very, very good correlation, the relative importance of each of the TFs. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about the same thing, but now I'm going to focus on looking at transcription factors in addition as opposed to histomarks. So we can do the same game that we did for histomarks. Here are all the transcription factors in the worm uh, genome, and here's how each of the factor, and he, here are all the bins, and here's how each of the factors is correlated with the level of gene expression. You see that, you see a, a sort of similar thing, some things that are correlated, there's positive, some things are repressive, they're negative, and you can see how this is very punctate. It's very, very clear right at the TSS, that's where the, the binding is significant. Um, and then you can ask how predictive are the TFs of the level of gene expression, and just for interest of time, I'm just going to show you the, the human result, which is a, a bit better than the um, uh, model organism result, mostly because of the scale. And the, and the really neat thing is you can, it works really well. <laughs> you can predict the level of gene expression from all the um, ENCODE TFs using this machinery we developed in mod ENCODE uh, with an R of about 0.81. And here's the relative importance of all the uh, different TFs. Now, this actually produces a paradox that you might think about for a second. How is it, with a fairly small number of TFs, you can predict the level of, the gene, of gene expression for all the genes when there's thousands of TFs in the genome? And this is in the, the human and, and, and mouse genomes. You might say, well, I thought that the level of gene expression of a gene was determined by the intricate binding of literally thousands of factors. How can I do well, so well with only a few? And that's actually shown here where I show just using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven factors, how well we're able to predict. And actually up at seven or eight, eight factors, we're able to predict extremely well. Um, I think that um, people have had some various rationalizations for why this works. We're not actually sure why it does. But one rationalization is that, remember, this is a statistical correlation, and it might be that um, what happens is you have something like a pioneering transcription factor that kind of comes in, pries things open, and really is um, associated with the specificity. But once the chromatin is open, you just have a, a large group of TFs that are going to bind there, uh, irrespective of the, of the type of gene, and so you get a fairly good uh, correlation. But in any case, a very surprising uh, result. Uh, the other thing we found was we could look just for the TFs, just like for the histomarks, of which bins were important, and here you see very clearly the TFs a very, very strong signal just at the TSS as opposed to the histomarks, which are uh, all of the thing. And then you could ask, if you put the TFs together with the histomarks, would you do better? And actually, you don't do it better. So they're, they're completely redundant, or they're redundant. There's no new information in putting the TFs together with the histomarks. And of course, that might suggest to you that the TFs and the histomarks contain some redundant information, and in and of themselves, the TFs might be able to predict the histomarks or vice versa. So we played the same game. Uh, bins for the histomarks, bins for the transcription factors. Can we go back and forth and predict them? The usual machinery with statistical prediction. And here's what we found. This is the result now from the worm. This is what we had in the worm analysis. These are all the different histomarks. Here are all the different TFs. Let's just look at this one row, which I don't know if you can read it, but it says HLH1. This is one factor. Here's how each of the marks predict the binding of that factor. The blue, obviously, not so strong. Okay, but then when you integrate all these things together, that's shown in this column, you get a pretty good prediction, and that the value in this column is actually shown in this bar chart here. So you get a fairly good um, prediction just using a chromatin model. But you might say, well, geez, I can figure out where a TF is going to bind because I have a motif. I know specifically where that TF is going to bind. Um, and so you can actually put the um, PWM together um, with the chromatin model, and you'll get a more successful um, uh, prediction. And I think there's a very easy intuition for that. You find the regions of open chromatin with the model, and then you find where it binds with the PWM. I just quickly say that we use the same machinery to find um, lots of enhancers, you know, building a chromatin model, and um, uh, to find lots of enhancers for the human, the exact same machinery that we developed in mod ENCODE. Um, and very quickly, I'll just say that when you do that, you can build not only a normal proximal regulatory network, but a distal regulatory network for the distal edges. And it has a very different structure, you can see, from the proximal network, showing the very different type of regulation you get distally. And so I'd just like to summarize what I've talked about today. So I talked about uh, insights we got from the um, worm mod encode and how we've used this uh, for the human genome annotation. Uh, the, 
I talked about um, how we did um, analysis of the expression time course. We found coordinated binding expression. Uh, and we also found lots of splicing changes. The way we looked at non-occurring RNAs and the importance of evidence integration and not just looking at one data set. And I focused on this example of transcribed pseudogenes where we could find about, say, 10% of them were transcribed. Then I talked about the overall distribution of chromosomal activity. Um, and we found these ideas of repressed arms in terms of chromatin. And also we identified uh, hot spots of TF binding. Um, and we found that most of the constrained regions had some form of activity. And then I spent a lot of time talking about the regulatory um, network. And here we found that we could arrange the TF binding into a hierarchy with great differences in properties between the level. This hierarchy could be integrated with the microRNA regulation. Um, and then I also talked about how we could drill in down and look at little network motifs. And we saw this great prevalence both in the worm and the human of feed forward loops. And then finally, I tried to put, this, to put all these things together in the framework of statistical models, looking at statistical models that could predict gene expression from histomarks. It's rather amazing. I think you can do this for protein coding genes and microRNAs. And the fact that we find similar results for transcription factors, and it's a bit of a paradox that you can get such great predictive performance from only a few TFs. And then at the very end, I talked about how you could find where the TFs themselves would bind from the uh, histomarks. Uh, um, both with the PWM and not, and how uh, we later found this very useful for identifying enhancers. So now, of course, I want to acknowledge all the people, and I'll first just do the um, ENCODE acknowledgments. As Eric Green said, we expect to see really big lists of people here, and um, you're going to see that right now. Uh, I'm not even going to try to list all the people in the main ENCODE project, um, but I will list two sub-collaborations within them. One's called the NETS Element um, Collaboration, and the other is called the GenCode Collaboration. So the, in the NETS element um, collaboration, we focused on the regulatory networks. Um, and this was uh, partially led by Mike uh, Snyder. A lot of the data production was from him. And the, um, a lot of the main analysts were Anshul um, Kandaji, um, Chow Cheng, uh, Jasmine Mew, Hector Karana, uh, Joe Rozovsky, uh, Roger Alexander, and um, Ren Quinn Min. And also, a lot of the enhancer work was done with Ewan Bernie, who led the overall ENCODE analysis and um, Peter Bickle and Ben Brown. For looking at the human um, non coronaries this is part of the GenCo thing, which is really uh, work from Jennifer Harrow, Adam Frankish, uh, Saganthi Balasrami, Viking Pei, and Christina Sisu. Uh, now, finally, of course, and most importantly, I'm going to acknowledge the, um, mod, the Worm Mod ENCODE project. And so this is the entire uh, Worm Mod ENCODE bunch. Um, and it's, uh, there's more than 130 names on this thing. It's a very large uh, effort that really encompassed a lot of uh, people. Uh, a lot of the data generation was, of course, um, led by uh, Mike Snyder for the TFs, Bob uh, Watterson for the, um, for the transcription, Jason Lieb, and Lincoln Stein participated a lot in the um, analysis. And there was a lot of uh, other contributions from many of the other um, co-PIs, particularly Ladino Hillier, Valerie Ranke, Gus Micklem. And a lot of the main analysts include um, John Liu, um, Eric Van Nostrand, uh, Chow Cheng, um, Tao Lu, Kevin Yip, they did a lot of the uh, work with um, finding hot regions, finding non occurring RNAs, and building the uh, statistical models. I should also acknowledge, I mean, there's 130 people on this uh, list. I mean, this is a serious uh, challenge, keeping all these people working together. And so I think we should also acknowledge the NHGRI um, program officers, particularly Peter Good, who put a lot of um, effort into uh, keeping us all working together. Uh, so, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention. And you have to speak simply because I'm a fly guy. Um, the, it was very, it's very impressive work and in, in, in analysis over time course and so on. Um, it's difficult as biologists to know how to use sort of grinded up animal transcription factor levels. Also, I'm unclear on how, um, since different transcription factors can act wildly differently in different cell types and so on, how your models and your networks are either able to account for that or that I'm you know, going to be able to make use of those to make predictions for my tissue of, of uh, interest? So the way I would answer is, I mean, I think the, one of the goals of the um, integrative analysis in uh, mod ENCODE, and, and also this is true of ENCODE, is to build a reference annotation that is, um, can be used as a resource for people to come to. And I think to get a sense of how you might use a reference annotation, let's think about how you might use the gene set, OK? So different genes are active 
in different tissues and different cells and so forth, but it's still useful having a comprehensive human gene list and to go to reference, for, go, go to that as a reference to look at which genes are active in different cell types. And likewise, we'd like to have a comprehensive reference of a kind of an overall wiring diagram for the, for the, for the organism with the, the knowledge that different bits of that wiring diagram are going to be turned on in different cell types. And I think that's the way I think about it. I mean, I think it was like the blueprint for this building. There's all the wires in this building. Only a fraction of them are turned on at this particular time in this particular room. But I think it's nice having the overall wiring diagram to get a global sense of things. And that's the kind of way I think I would deal with it. Since C. elegans is used as an aging model, and since presumably in the metadata you have ages of all the basic assays done on this, um, have you looked at any of these parameters in an aging axis? Uh, well, certainly, um, we, you know, for the uh, gene expression uh, measurements, there's a lot of very careful work done by Bob Worston, also by Frank Slack, uh, looking, uh, you know, at, uh, <laughs> I guess, old, old worms. Uh, and, and so forth. And I, I can't say to the degree if, you could, if we found a particular thing that would characterize the gene expression of, of things getting um, older, but I think that's more of my lack of knowledge on that particular thing. I don't know if Bob would want to comment or something, but we certainly looked at that. Was there any, was there any signatures for age that we, we found there? Yeah. Frank worked harder at looking at the microRNA uh, data with stages. Uh, we, we did less of that with, uh, with the poly A uh, RNA. And Frank certainly has, uh, has microRNAs that, uh, that uh, look like they're signatures or, or certainly are more highly expressed in older worms and, and others that are, that are lost. So I think one of the big challenges in, in biology today is figuring out which cis elements and trans elements actually regulate a particular gene in an animal, as opposed to some simplified model system. And hearing you talk about the pseudogenes, I'm struck by you have these 200 pseudogenes that are differently, differentially regulated with respect to their um, parallels, if you will. Has, has anyone gone back and said, what are the differences in the cis elements, the transbinding factors between these, to try and figure out what's regulating the so-called wild-type paralog or what's regulating the pseudogene? No, that, that's an excellent, that's a really excellent question. And um, I should say I'm extremely interested in that. And some of that was done to some degree in um, human ENCODE. I mean, we, one of the things that we found when human ENCODE, which I, I found was particularly interesting is, we found um, lots of examples of partial activity um, of uh, pseudogenes. In particular, we found at some degree of active chromatin, some degree of transcription factor binding upstream of them relative to their um, living parent. And you, know, you can speculate what that means. One, I one idea is you have a gene that dies. And well, it doesn't all die at once. You know, it, it, this transcribes, people are talking about aging. This is the aging gene. It, you know, it, it's not transcribed, but maybe, maybe it's um, upstream still is maintained to some degree, and you can see things binding to it. I think that's an extremely interesting question that you know, we, we haven't done enough on, but I, I'm particularly interested in it. 